Greetings, brethren, wherever you may be keeping the Feast of Tabernacles around the world. As we all know, this feast pictures the kingdom of God on earth, the 1,000-year period when Jesus Christ will rule this earth from Jerusalem and all the saints, his called and chosen people, down through the ages, will be ruling and serving under him, and that includes all of us. I'm sure that you're hearing some inspiring messages about God's coming kingdom and our part in it, and I hope the message of this feast video will also encourage and inspire you, brethren. Let's briefly review what God reveals in his word about the meaning of this feast, and then what God wants us to be doing in his church and work today. So let's begin by looking at the incredible meaning of the Feast of Tabernacles. Zechariah chapter 14, and we'll begin reading in verse 1. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, and your spoil will be divided in your midst. And then drop down to verse 9. The Lord shall be king over all the earth, and that day it shall be. The Lord is one, and his name is one. So this is talking about the return of Jesus Christ to rule on this earth. And then let's notice the well-known verses 16 through 19. And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it shall be that whichever of the families of the earth do not come up to Jerusalem, to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, on them there will be no rain. If the family of Egypt will not come up and enter in, they shall have no rain. They shall receive the plague with which the Lord strikes the nations who do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So brethren, we know that when Christ returns, all nations will learn to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And that's why we keep it every year. We're preparing for that time. And let's notice what Micah says about the kingdom of God. Verses 1 through 4, chapter 4. And it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and peoples shall flow to it. Many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion the law shall go forth, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge between many peoples, and rebuke strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, and neither shall they learn war any more. Then notice verse 4, the peace that will come. But everyone shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one will make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. And so, brethren, this feast pictures a wonderful time of peace on earth when no one will be afraid. Now, if you want to know the state of the world and where we are now and what is immediately ahead and what is going to happen next, you have to get it from one source only. I found the church through listening to the radio, Mr. Armstrong. WOAI San Antonio, Texas, the 50,000 watt clear channel station. But I was uh, at one time interested in being, becoming a cartoonist. In the evening, I would sit at my easel and I would uh, work on my course, and so I turned the radio on. My father owned a small printing company, and he did in a hometown newspaper, and I would go help him put the papers together. And uh, one day he told me there's this program that you've got to be listening to. Um, he said that there's no prayers, no organ music, and then he told me a little bit about Mr. Armstrong. And I said, do you suppose 
that they're preparing the way for the second coming of Christ, like John the Baptist did for the first. And then I thought, where did that come from? We've never heard anything about the second coming of Christ. I grew up as a young teenage boy in Oklahoma during the Dust Bowl days and the Great Depression. And from there, we went into the war years. And I had sent in for the booklet, Should a Christian Fight? <laughs> and I got it about the same time I'd got orders to go to Korea. And I was reading that and we were talking about it. I said, I think I'm in the wrong business. <laughs> I lived in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania at the time, but I was visiting a cousin in the Washington, D.C. area. And he was having, he had worked on his car that day and he asked me to take a ride with him to see if the car was okay. And I guess we were out on the road about an hour and that whole time he told me that he was going to uh, raise his newborn daughter very differently. She wouldn't be keeping Christmas and things like that. Well, I thought this was the craziest thing I had ever heard. And uh, I went to bed that night, and probably about 10, 10.30. And about one o'clock I woke up and I could not sleep because I was thinking about all the things that he was telling me. And I was going for hours. I mulled them over in my head. And uh, my thinking changed by morning. My thinking was different. When it come to the Sabbath, I was having to go to the motor pool and work on a tank because I was a tank driver. And I asked my sergeant if there's any way I could get out of going to the motor pool on Saturday. And he said, as long as your tank is running, you don't have to go to the motor pool on Saturday. And my tank never broke down. I mean, it, <laughs> it was amazing to think that God was so far out ahead of me. And he was just taking you on, well, you've, you know, you're a farm boy, but if you just wait, these things are going to work out if you just... <laughs> I was learning so much, and I, I just couldn't get enough of the learning. And I was just taking it all in, but learning about the kingdom, that there was something to work for and something to grow for, and something that was going to help everybody. Not just a few people or whatever, it was for everybody. The kingdom of God was very intriguing, because on the program it talked about the kingdom of God coming to the earth. It seemed very practical, relevant, and really a problem-solving uh, type of experience for the earth. So I found all this to be very, very intriguing, and uh, I love the doctrine, and the teachings about the kingdom of God. I was very happy when we started studying 1 Corinthians 7, and we found out that you chose, because God called your parents, you could choose to come into the church. And so for me, the first love was a, a different experience. Well, since I grew up in the church, um, you know, I'd been taught God's way my whole life. Um, I don't know that I really internalized that to be mine until I was graduated from college. Um, I had been through a lot of things during college years. Uh, losing my dad was one of them. And, you know, it was a very, very young age and very premature death. And that definitely got me thinking about how short life is and how, um, you know, we're just very, you know, we're mortal and, you know, things don't go on forever. I remember when I was 11 years old, I, I never had any thought of leaving the church. I just figured I'd always be coming to church. And this was my church. And when I was about 11 years old, I remember taking ownership of it and, and figuring one day I'll get baptized and that's just the way it'll be. And so I learned the truth from an early age and it was normal for me. But it wasn't until I was about 20 years old that it started to take on deeper meaning. And I remember reading the booklet, uh, The Gospel of the Kingdom, or the, the, King, the Gospel of the Kingdom of God, I forget the exact title. But suddenly it just started to make sense to me. Uh, something clicked in my mind. Obviously God was calling me at the time. Within a year of that I was baptized. I would go out on Sabbath mornings on this upper porch on the second floor, and I would um, uh, I would take my Bible and some booklets and I would stay out there all day and read. And when I look back, they were, they were some of the most, some of those most wonderful times of my life. I, I had experienced a peace and a joy that I had never known before. You know, these awesome truths of God were really penetrating, you know. Uh, before I saw, you know, when I was 14, I saw that the world was wrong. Now I was seeing how much I had to change personally. I grew up in uh, the Methodist Church. Protestant Church. Ukrainian Orthodox. I started uh, telling my parents about the, uh, you know, what I was learning. Now, uh, I, they actually persecuted me. My, my parents actually persecuted me. It caused problems at first. For a while it caused problems because we, uh, 
We left the Methodist Church and followed some crazy religion. They said they were going to put me in an insane asylum, told me that they were going to disinherit me, which they did. Uh, they uh, tore up my literature, they actually tore up all my literature. Uh, by the time I was 16, uh, I got a post office box. And I was probably the only 16-year-old in that town that had a post, his own post office box. The only thing is, it was two miles away, and I had to walk four miles uh, up there to get my, uh, my literature. And nobody will ever forget their first feast. We strive all year long trying to emulate the kingdom as we live. But then when you go to the feast, the kingdom is just, I mean, it's on, as I say, on fire. I mean, it's just, just full of desire and love. It was something that uh, made life worthwhile, made living worthwhile, looking forward to that time, and that eternal life in God's presence. You know, the, the kingdom of God, it, it, you, you live it, you live it through the year, but when God says, you come to this place where I set my name, then that's the love really, really emphasized. Brethren, let's consider now the incredible attitude of humility that Jesus Christ had and modeled and taught for us to have so that we can serve with him in his kingdom. In Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 through 28, here's what Christ taught his disciples and taught us. The mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons, that was James and John, and kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said to her, what do you wish? And she said to him, grant that these two sons of mine may sit one on your right hand and the other on the left in your kingdom. And Jesus answered and said, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I am able to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said to him, we are able. And he said to them, you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with, but to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared by my Father. So God the Father is preparing for each of us a job, a duty, a responsibility, an opportunity of service in his kingdom. He will determine that, Jesus Christ said. And when the ten heard the question and wanted to sit on his right hand and his left hand, they were moved with indignation against the two brothers. And then Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, the people. And those who are great exercise authority over them, the people. And yet it shall not be so among you. But whosoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. So brethren, it is so very important that all of us by the grace of God and with the help of God that we help one another, that we work together to develop this same attitude of humility that Jesus Christ had. Notice what Jesus said in John 13, a scripture we all know well that we hear especially before the Passover service. In John 13, verses 14 and 15, Jesus said to the disciples, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. So here is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, humbling himself, brethren, getting down on his knees to wash the feet of the disciples. What an incredible, wonderful example for all of us to do that for one another and for any of God's people and for all of mankind to humble ourselves like Jesus Christ. And then in the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verses 5, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a servant and coming in the likeness of men. 
and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. And so brethren, I want to elaborate on this point for a moment, that we sincerely and deeply as ministers and servants in the United Church of God want to learn to become humble servants like Jesus Christ. P please pray for us and we will pray for you brethren that we all can grow together and more perfectly model ourselves after Jesus Christ. The Council of Elders has approved and encouraged us in the ministry to set the example of Christ-like service. We know that's biblical. We know it's what we need to be doing and should be doing. And with God's help, we'll be doing more of and better. We want to grow in the area of serving as Christ serves. I want to encourage all of you brethren, wherever you are, wherever you're going to church, to pray about this, please, that Jesus Christ will help us all to develop more humble Christ-like attitudes and become like him in service. And at every level of service in the church, wherever you are, jump in there and serve. Let God use your talents and abilities and ask him to show you how you can contribute to his church and his work that we might all serve more like Jesus Christ. Well, serving, uh, it really also, it brings you a lot closer to the people in the church, to the congregation, because that's what you're serving. You're, ser you're serving God, of course, but you're serving them too. You're doing something to help them, doing something for them, you know, and something they appreciate uh, you're doing. And anytime you feel like that you're a part of it, then as we say, you own it, you have more confidence, and you feel that what you're doing is worth something. In so many ways when it comes to service in the church, it's a team effort. We all know the scriptures about, you know, the toe and the foot and the arm and the head and, you know, every part of the body is important. At first there was a deacon over us telling us we had to, <laughs> us bachelors. We were the ones that had to come early to the Bible study and lift these heavy tables. It seemed like we had to carry them a half a mile away. Uh, I see, again, uh, ownership being taken by an entirely different generation. And down deep, that gives me a great sense of joy, is that now I'm at the age I am. Uh, I'm not old, but you know, I'm older. And to see another generation, one generation behind me, that is not just there on standby, but actually doing things. If you want to help, the thing of it is, you don't have to have somebody say you have a specific job. All you've got to do is go to God and say, I want to serve and then stand back because you're going to find yeah. dozens of ways to serve, you know. Sometimes you just kind of say, well, it's too much, and then God kind of pulls it back. You say, no, I didn't mean it, God, you know. Bring it on, so <laughs> it would come on. Like I said, it makes you feel more a, a part of the church than a bystander. Uh, I mean, no one really, if they're in an organization, I don't mean to uh, call the church an organization, but if you're in an organization, you don't, really want to be a bystander. Uh, it, 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 it takes all the fun out of it, really, and all the joy out of it. But getting in there and getting your hands soiled, you might say, and getting tired, but looking back and say, well, I, I was able to do this, I was able to do that. It makes you feel a part of the church. And the church is God's family, it's God's children. And that's what we all want to be a part of, is, is God's, uh, God's family and be His children and serving makes you uh, feel more a part of it. And there's people like that all over the United States, all over the world in the church. They're there right from the beginning and they're always there for you each and every Sabbath. And you know, it doesn't matter whether deacon, elder, or member, you know, it really doesn't matter. These people are, are much loved because of their loyalty and their service. When I first started going to church, it was amazing to me how there would be one or two there that really made you feel welcome. 
you know, and, you know, take you around and introduce you to other people. Make you feel like, because, you know, when we, when I first went to church, she wasn't with me that week because since she was expecting our son any time. And this one man, I mean, I never will forget him. You know, he took me around, introduced me to people. And at that time, there was over 300 people there in Cincinnati, just the one church. And I thought, you know, when I went up there, I thought it was probably me and two or three people and Mr. Armstrong. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know, I get there and there's 300 and some people there. Truly, as a Christian, you never quit serving. In fact, the more you get a position, the more dedicated you are and the more service you give. You know, some of these things you saw through ministry, uh, that has a lot to do with you willing to serve, is how they serve. You know, the new thing that, that the uh, United has come out and said that the, to be a Christ-like servant, you, you see this over the years, but you maybe couldn't have put the title to it. You knew where it was coming from, but the title, and to, to build on that title, it will, it will spread, you know. It'll go through those that, that are doing it. No matter how low you are, how old you are, how young you are, it will spread. When I was younger, I wanted to be a missionary. And when I found out about the Church of God and, and uh, the world tomorrow, all, all of a sudden I realized that Christ was going to be here on this earth and that we were going to be a part of that, a part of that government. And we, can, we could be a part of changing this world. So in a sense, I would have that, I would be a missionary. From the very beginning, uh, knowing that there was a work being done, I wanted to be a part of that work. And so we did everything we could, uh, even before the home office was built. Dave and I would drive down to Cincinnati, do the good news stuffings, and, um, and we did, you know, we thought there was a work being done, we wanted to be a part of a work. Here at the Home Office, we're pretty much in three departments. Uh, you have the uh, President's Administration, and they're pretty much all together in three or four offices, one after the other. That includes financial services, where Mr. Dean works as Treasurer. Then we have Ministerial Services, which is another section here at the Home Office. And then the third area, of course, is the Media Department, Media and Communication Services. Right now, we really do have an element of peace at the Home Office. And when you see the employees working together, when you see our United News Managing Editor, Mitch Moss, working with uh, Nick Bizzik, who is our, our, our main proofreader for our publications, uh, interacting. Even when you look at Beyond Today and the production team involved there, there are three or four video editors and production staff that are uh, certainly uh, very talented. They've had some excellent training in their college years and, at, and in the university uh, training and have brought a lot to our team. I really see among my co-workers here at the Home Office a spirit of service and a spirit of humble service. One area I see this of course is in our mail processing area. We have two areas, there's the incoming mail and there's the outgoing mail. And in the incoming mail, uh, that section is actually upstairs on the second floor of the Home Office. We have Connie Seelig and Alex Surratt that manage the department. We have about uh, six or eight employees that uh, have various responsibilities. And they do it with uh, a smile on their face and with a, an attitude of, of humble service. Then there's the outgoing mail, and that's downstairs right next to the warehouse where outgoing mail is processed. And we have uh, several full-time and part-time employees there that are involved in licking the stamps, so to speak. We have a, a wonderful internet department. As you no doubt have heard, we have updated our ucg.org website. It's more of a mega site now and it now incorporates the, the magazine sites and it's doing very well. And so through the internet and our website presence we're able to reach around the globe like never before. Uh, Aaron Booth, Tom Disher are really appreciated in being able to make sure that happens. There certainly is an element of, of peace and camaraderie right now that we really appreciate. But conditions right now in the church are so positive and constructive and uh, in a state of um, optimism and rebuilding that I absolutely love my work 
and I have never enjoyed a job as much as I have working with ministerial services at this time. And I really feel that in the home office now, that are so dedicated to serving the brethren, serving the church, and praying before every function to make sure that God is totally involved every time. Really makes you want to make sure you don't let down the other people because each of us holds up our portion. That's all part of the whole body being involved in service. And it's very important that nobody feels that their small part is insignificant because the whole body has to work together when it comes to doing our part to help prepare Christ's bride and to preach the gospel of God's kingdom. And I think the church can, as they continue to feed, they continue to teach, and I think to continue teaching the, the, the greatest ability that Christ had was to teach us how to be humble. One of the aspects of Christ's service that I hadn't thought about till recently was the fact that he served his entire ministry. Yet his final act of service, when he was just about ready to die and become God again, spirit being, he washes their feet. Christ came to serve, and he expects us to serve, and we're supposed to have a serving attitude year round. And so when someone starts to think outside of themselves and thinks about the needs of the other person, it's a, it's a character building uh, exercise. And that's what God expects of us. And now let's look at an incredible prophecy in the book of Daniel as we're focusing on the meaning of this Feast of Tabernacles and why we're all keeping it. In Daniel chapter 7, let's begin with verse 13 of Daniel 7. Daniel was given a vision and he said, I was watching in the night visions, visions of the future, of Christ's return, the kingdom of God. And he said, Behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the Ancient of Days. And this is Jesus Christ, the one like the Son of Man is Christ, coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the Ancient of Days, God the Father. And they brought him, Christ, near before him, the Father. And then he, to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. So Daniel was given a vision of the return of Christ and the kingdom of God on earth. And then notice amazing verse 27. And then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven all the kingdoms of this earth shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey Him. So even in this prophecy in Daniel, God reveals that those who are called to be God's people, called the saints, are going to be given rulership in the kingdom of God over all nations on earth. So brethren, it's truly exciting and amazing to understand the truth of God and the wonderful plan that He has and why we're here keeping the Feast of Tabernacles or wherever you may be on the face of the earth. Let's go to the New Testament, Luke chapter 12. And we'll notice here what Jesus says about the kingdom of God. Some very important scriptures in Luke Chapter 12, verses 31 and 32. Christ said to his disciples and to all of us, But seek the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. And then he added, Do not fear, little flock. God's people, God's church, have always been a little flock on this earth. And he said, For it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And so, brethren, God is planning to give opportunity to serve with Jesus Christ in His kingdom and to help bring peace to this earth. What a wonderful time lies ahead for all mankind. And then one more scripture on this part of this message in Revelation chapter 20, one that we all know very well and we're looking forward to its fulfillment. Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 through 6. John wrote, I saw thrones and they that sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded 
for their witness to Jesus and the Word of God. Many people give their lives as martyrs serving God. And those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. That's the period of the millennium called the kingdom of God on earth. And it goes on, the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. We all know that's referring to another resurrection after the thousand years when those who have not been called by God will be resurrected from the dead and given the opportunity to know God and this truth. And it goes on in verse 5, this is the first resurrection. This part of the verse is referring to verse 6. There were no verses when God inspired this. Remember that. So this is the first resurrection and carrying on in verse 6. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So there's that promise, brethren, to all of us and all of God's people all over the face of the earth, those that are truly converted and have God's Spirit and are preparing their lives to serve with Jesus Christ. This promise applies to them, that they will become priests of God and of Christ and will rule with Him for a thousand years in the kingdom of God. The biggest thing I've learned from, from trials in my life and and they've been many. There's no question I've seen, you know, I'm, I'm soon to be 59. And I've seen a lot of things from my youth all the way through. And the one thing that I've learned more than anything else is, is faith in God. And I've learned that through patience because I've had to develop a lot of patience because there were things that you see that you thought you could fix. But it's, it's, it's a fine line in trying to figure out exactly what you should do. And patience is a big thing. It really is. And I don't think you can have faith without patience. That's, that's the criteria I've seen. So many people, it goes long enough and long enough and long enough, well, it's so bad I've got to do something. And sometimes you don't. Sometimes it's God's to handle. Well, one thing I learned long ago, and of course I tried to teach the churches that I pastored, uh, that uh, you can't put your confidence or trust or faith in man. We can draw strength from others of a like mind, but uh, we, we must keep our minds on God. Uh, he's, the, he's the source of strength. He's the source of peace. He's the God of peace. He, the Bible calls him the God of peace. And it's a great peace of they which love God's law and nothing will offend him. Knowing that God was in charge and he doesn't bring you through any trial that you're not able to bear, always let me know that if I fail the test, I messed up because I was stronger than that but didn't think I was. I think while trials come, the, if it's a trial and it doesn't become a blessing to me, it's, it's my fault. If it doesn't turn into a blessing, it's my fault. When you fail, actually the lesson in that is that you learn that you were stronger and you, you messed up. So next time you should go a step farther. And so God continually brings you forward through those trials. We were having uh some car problems one Sabbath, getting ready to go to Sabbath services. And we couldn't get the doors to stay shut. So I said, well, let's stop at the uh, dealership and have the mechanic look at it. So uh, I think my wife must have sat in the back seat and held the door shut while I drove there. And we pulled into the dealership and I went to the door. Well, a man came to the door and I said, I need to see a mechanic. He said, well, they're not here till nine o'clock. Well, in the meantime, a car was driving by. He pulled in the parking lot for what reason, I don't know, pulled in and parked and the man got out and walked over to us and said, are you having a problem? And I said, I'm having a problem with that door. I can't get it to latch. So he went over and he fooled around with it and he got him to latch. And he went and walked back over to get in his car to leave. And I said, excuse me, sir. I said, are you an angel? And he just smiled and got in his car and drove off. One time uh, when I was about 31, uh, I don't know what was wrong with me. Uh, maybe it was a blood sugar problem. Or, a, um, or something else, you know, people now get very weak and they, you know, they have some illness, but uh, I felt like a man of 90. Uh, 
I couldn't even put my hands over my head and hold them there very long. They felt like they were 100 pound weights. And uh, I was anointed at church. I was in Washington, D.C. at the time. And afterwards, uh, I was fasting and I prayed that night and I asked God to heal me. And all of a sudden, I just felt something just like like strength, just an immediate thing come into my body. And I remember thinking, now, was I just healed? <laughs> you know, I, I didn't, I wasn't sure, you know, uh, as it turned out I was. And uh, when something like that happens to you, you, you realize there is a, pers a God who is personally, personally uh, interested in you, concerned about you, and uh, who loves you deeply. And, and again, another thing I learned from that, it's faith's not something you work up. It's not something you work up, it's a gift. I truly had come to the point where I believed God would heal me, and he gave me that. It's nothing I, of myself, could do. But uh, when that happens, it really does touch you deeply. We must put our faith in God. We must put our faith in his word. And it's there that we will really be able to overcome and live right on through it and be victorious and waiting for his coming kingdom. I've seen so many trials where I could see God's hand in it. Uh, usually later on, uh, occasionally he'll, he'll give you a clip, I suppose, that uh, lets you know he's working with it now. There's lessons that we learn and I think sometimes the only way you see the lesson is step back and look at it. And I have seen deliverance time and time and time and time again. I, I feel like God has delivered us from the most difficult situations which were impossible from the human standpoint to fix to bringing about not only victory but the best for all concerned particularly the brethren in the church no matter what the trial is just face it and ask god to uh, take care of the rest I have prayer and bible study and then whatever happens during the day okay <laughs> i'll just have to deal with it We've had circumstances and then said, well, we'll, um, we'll make the best of this and we'll just call it another adventure. It's when we just sort of look at each other and say, oh, okay, it's another adventure in life. I wrote a hymn and um, it's in our hymnal and it's like that peace that passes understanding will guard your hearts and minds and you ask for it and God does give it and that's, that's, um, that's how I can find peace, knowing that God cares and that He will answer the prayers. Maybe not what I want, but they'll be answered. God has three ways of answering. He can say yes, or He can say no. And He also can say, let's wait a while. Sometimes we have to patiently wait on, because the answer might not come at exactly that time. When you know the end of the book, it makes it very easy to not worry about whether you live or die through a trial because you know you're going to be part of his family. You know what you have to do. You know this life is temporary. And so you don't look at life the same way. And the kingdom of God being part of his family and the most comforting thing to me is to know that when I made a spirit being, God will know that I have been tested. Let's review what Christ has called us to be doing as a church in preparation for his soon coming kingdom. This is called the mission of the church. It's why we are organized and work together, why we want to strive to cooperate and have teamwork and all work together in harmony and unity to accomplish the mission that Jesus Christ has given us. And I will turn to the Gospel of Mark in chapter 1 and we're going to be following the example of Jesus Christ. Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. And after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. And in chapter 16 of Mark, verse 15, Jesus Christ said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, to every person. And brethren, we want to do our part in the United Church of God to do that. We are part of the Church of God, part of God's people, part of the work of God. And we want to fulfill that commission from Jesus Christ 
As long as we live and as long as we have time, we want to keep preaching the wonderful good news of the kingdom of God, the answer to all the world's problems, the answer to all of our problems, the return of Christ, and the establishment of his rule on earth. That is our mission, brethren. And with God's help, we will fulfill that mission. We will not quit. We will not fail. We will not give up. We will never quit or give up preaching the gospel, the good news of the kingdom of God. And we thank you, brethren, for your part in that. In Matthew chapter 24, we'll see as a reminder here of what Christ said as we approach the end of this age. Matthew chapter 24, verses 12 through 14. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. The NIV, the New International Version, says the love of most will grow cold. Brethren, let's not let that happen. Let's be absolutely determined that we will not grow cold or lukewarm in doing the work of God. Let's renew our zeal and our enthusiasm in doing the work of God in the face of their, this earth. Jesus Christ went on and said in verse 14, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. And looking at world events, we're getting closer, brethren. We're getting closer. So let's keep at it, doing the work of God. And in Matthew 28, Jesus Christ also reminded us of another part of the mission of the church that we're all involved in together. In verses 18 through 20, he said to the disciples, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Brethren, it's very clear that Christ also wants us to band together, work together, stick together, learn to humble ourselves, and cooperate and take this message of God's coming kingdom and that he is calling people today and preparing them to be teachers and leaders and rulers and servants in his coming kingdom. And let's be doing that with our whole heart because God is reaching out to people all over the face of the earth and calling them into his church. And we'll keep at that. Many of you know what is written on the seal of the United Church of God. It's on the podiums of many congregations where it shows the world, a globe. And then at the top it says, preaching the gospel and preparing a people. That's our mission. All of you, brethren, every one of you, wherever you are, whoever you are listening to this, you are an important part of the work of God, of helping to accomplish our Christ-given mission as a church in preaching the gospel to the world and preparing a people serving those that God calls, encouraging them and helping them, encouraging one another, sticking together to help one another prepare for God's kingdom. When you really start to understand the kingdom, even early, the first feast just, it just meant so much. And you don't about your first love. The first love to me has always been seeking the kingdom and his righteousness. The, the kingdom has really taken on a, a greater meaning. The, the, the longer you go, the longer you're in God's church, the longer you, uh, longer you live because you just long for that. You say, you know, that, that's, that's the answer to my problems. That's the, that's the whole solution to everybody's problems. And why can't it come sooner? And I, I think as I, the older I get and the further I go in church, the more I think, Christ, your kingdom come, please what I'm waiting for. It's the goal, you know, you always have to have your eyes on that goal. Uh, when the children of Israel uh, on the way to the promised land got uh, their eyes off of that, their goal, which was the promised land, they, they died like so many flies out there in the wilderness. And uh, so again, it's a stabilizing thing. I mentioned before, as we seek 
to go to the feast, we're actually seeking that time to where we're going to go to the place where God has placed His name. <laughs> and if we get the connection that we're living all year and looking toward that, that harvest, uh, it, it answers a lot of questions that, uh, and, and helps you keep going, putting one foot ahead of the other. I'm looking forward to God's kingdom to be established upon this earth and that the work can go forward in earnest of um, stand, putting justice and righteousness up to the forefront where it should be. Most people don't take the time to really think deeply. There's, there's so many distractions, you know. I don't have a cell phone, I don't have cable television, so I have an advantage that, that I do spend time thinking about things, you know, deep things like that. I work with people every day that are totally consumed with the entertainment um, part of, the, of our society. Um, I will say that I think you have to monitor that part of your life. And it's difficult. I'm surprised that teens can make it through the stresses that this world has now. They're much worse. You know, you made a mistake 50 years ago, you did some prank and, and you got spanked for it. You make a mistake today, you know, with drugs or something, and you can die from it. And the kids really do seem to have a, a dedication and a desire. I think they can see through this world. The problems are so bad now that even the glamour doesn't look as glamorous to them. And I, I see that in our teens and our young people. And even though Satan makes things seem desirable, I think they see the end result of the fame and the fortune, the power really doesn't give happiness. We need to keep you know, doing the work. We need to be working on ourselves. Uh, other than that, you know, that's the bottom line there, is, is overcoming and doing what God wants us to do. As a church, we need to all pitch in and do our part and encourage one another. In a world now that's full of discouragement, our way to help the church progress is, is help each individual. Just keep our focus on the kingdom and being praying, studying, and being a light to the world. When I see what's happening in this world, and the riots that are going on now, the wars that are going on now, in every corner of the earth, it makes me pray fervently for God's kingdom and to realize that the more that I can learn to be able to help other people, and the closer the kingdom, the closer I want it to be, and every day, obviously, it's a day closer. But I'm anticipating uh, what is to come, and I'm anticipating it not just for myself, but for everyone. There's many, many uh, parables that talks about the kingdom of God is like such and such, and it's such and such. And so Jesus gave so many things to show us the kingdom of God is the most desirable thing that we could desire to be a part of God's family and His kingdom right here on this earth when He comes. Uh, we're going to have peace on this earth someday. That, that it, we're not going to heaven, but God's kingdom is coming to this earth. And all of His uh, blessings and benefits will be shared with all mankind. There'll come a time when the entire world can know about the kingdom of God and know about God's way and be obeying and, and enjoying the peace and happiness that God wants all mankind to have. Your prayers, brethren, your service, make it possible, of course, with God's blessing. But brethren, you are so important to God and to God's church and to His work. We all love you and need you and we know you feel the same. We want to grow in the love of God and the love of Jesus Christ for one another. We are working hard here at the home office to do our part in the work of God and doing what Jesus wants us to do. We want to learn greater humility and greater love and service to God and to mankind. And we thank all of you for your hard work and your faithful service. Many of you stepped up to the plate and filled great needs in the United Church of God in this last year or six months. And we thank you for that. We thank you for your prayers, your love, your support for us, for all of God's people. Thank you, brethren. Thank you with my whole heart. Thank you from all of us here at the home office, for the staff and for the council of elders. Thank you. Brethren, 
Have a wonderful Feast of Tabernacles as you celebrate the soon coming kingdom of God.